We're going to listen to Devon Bernard, who is presenting us in React patterns for high performance. Please give a warm welcome to the speaker. Some, some 
typical uh, first steps you might do in a reducer is to you know create some library reducer where you have you know, some IDs and you're listing out cities and you know a list of libraries seems pretty intuitive. Um, what if now you want to incorporate you know all of the books from all those libraries? Uh, you know because the scope of the project changed. Some things that uh, a lot of people might think is a logical next step is to you know append all of the books uh, for each library. Uh, now of course one of the issues here is you're going to have some data redundancy, right? Like there's going to be books in multiple libraries, uh, but some people say, oh, that's not that big a deal, that's how our API works, that's fine. Um, but then if we want to take this step further, right, we say the scope of the project changes a bit more, what if we wanted to uh, describe all the authors of these books in more detail? Now all of a sudden you're adding an, an extra nested level of uh, data inside of your user, which uh, now it's an extra level of redundancy, uh, and it's just progressively making your app harder and harder to test, uh, and your, your endpoints are just getting larger and larger. Uh, so one of the ways that we can try and uh, simplify this is by flattening all, all of our structures. So here we can just have uh, references to objects instead of hierarchically uh, saving them or nesting them inside of other objects. Uh, and you know, it, part of this first step that's useful is now all the redundancy is gone. Um, you can simply reference an ID uh, instead of you know, copying a whole object. Uh, but this process is still kind of slow if you structure reducers in this way. Because imagine if, let's say, you wanted to modify a book. Uh, in this structure, you would need to kind of map over every single uh, you know, object and say, okay, is this the book that I'm looking for? If so, let's update it. Uh, so a, a common way that you can probably improve uh, that reducer strategy and make it a bit more effective uh, is when you're uh, indexing over IDs instead of just providing a basic list. Because uh, then you can directly access these objects. So, of course, this is, you know, talking about normalization. Uh, I'd say, in general, this uh, allows us to query things a lot faster. Uh, it, in general, it makes uh, our applications more flexible when we are storing things in a way that is about uh, the, the true representative state of that abstract data. It's not just, oh, we have these five separate pages. Let's store the data in a convenient way for every single page. So you're going to get more redundancy. It's going to be harder to test. Uh, and, and in general, that's kind of sub So, you know, when, when trying to talk about normalizing state, um, there, there's a lot of ways to do it. There's some simplistic examples, but uh, there's, of course, a lot of libraries out there that will do it for you. Uh, this is an example of, uh, you know, a library called Normalizer. Essentially, you provide some schema entities describing uh, each of the concepts that might be in this hierarchical structure. Uh, and then what you do is you just call normalize uh, on, that, on that big JSON, uh, and it will automatically flatten it uh, and do that ID lookup structure for you. Uh, so this is a pretty common and, and nice utility. Uh, as far as uh, making your reducers a bit more pure, uh, I know that there are uh, many ways that you can be trying to update some uh, from an action. Some people will say, uh, if your store is taking in a particular value, let's you know try and grab some state from another reducer uh, and use it here. Uh, in general, of course, we know that's bad practice. Uh, I'd say a simple, uh, sorry, a simple rule that you can use to uh, make your reducers a bit more testable. I'd say one, just don't modify any of the parameters that you're passing to it, uh, and two, try to not use any other external state or uh, touch anything. You know, you should only really ever be using uh, the variables that are provided to you as parameters. Uh, that, that's kind of the only things that you should be accessing when you're uh, inside of a reducer of action. Uh, now, as far as uh, some, some useful things that I've noticed in Redux, uh, that uh, a lot of developers that seem to use it, they don't really use the, the developer tools. Uh, a few quick examples of things I find great is, uh, it's a little hard to see here, but um, when the, uh, the React MVC app, uh, essentially you can do some to-dos and you can create a series of actions. But here what you're able to do is track the entire history uh, of all of your actions. So anytime something gets dispatched to the store, uh, you can both reverse it, uh, but also uh, you know play it back in, in a sequential order, uh, which is useful for understanding you know, what the state of your producer is. Um, separate from that, it's nice that um, Redux tools can actually write your unit tests for you. Uh, so whenever you have a particular action that's executed, uh, it will take the initial state, that action will give you an output state, uh, and it's very useful for uh, getting some initial boilerplate set together for you know creating a, a, a unit test from one of your actions. Uh, a separate great thing about Redux Dev Tools is whether you're trying to inspect the state of an entire reducer or just a few uh, actions, 
uh, essentially what you can do is you know, look at the payload of those things in a tree-like structure uh, and see how things are modified, which is pretty useful. Uh, uh, another point uh, when talking about you know, moving on to components, uh, I'd like to share a story. Imagine you're building some uh, you know, big dashboard page. Right? There's you know, clearly a, a lot of different APIs and endpoints that you're trying to talk to to you know, populate a, a very diverse, uh, data-rich application like this. But I would say one of the, the issues of, of pages like these uh, is imagine you get a call from one of your, your users and they say, this is what my page looks like. I you know, wait two or four seconds and then everything just shows up. Uh, I think that there's a lot of web applications that happen to do that, which is kind of an a unfortunate and unpolished experience. And when we look into why that kind of happens, uh, a, a lot of uh, developers will put these things called blockers uh, in their code where essentially you're preventing your Redux component from rendering anything until uh, it, its data is, is fully ready. So you know, one of the, the particular issues about when you have a blocker like this is you have five separate subcomponents that you would like to render, uh, but now if none of them, uh, you know, it, sorry, if one of them isn't even ready yet, you're, you're holding up all five, uh, which is problematic. So uh, not only is this slow, but it's actually very uh, dangerous in practice uh, to have these distributed blockers. So imagine if you have you know, one of these API endpoints, they fail, right? Uh, all of a sudden now, your, what your page is gonna look at is nothing, no, uh, you're gonna have nothing on that page because since one of the things failed, that blocker uh, took effect and now you're not getting any of those five components. Uh, so we look at how we wanna unblock uh, or remove the, those blocks from our code. Uh, one of the things that you're able to do is uh, not block on entire structure, but instead, uh, for every single piece of data that is only relevant to that specific component, uh, use that for uh, populating. And one of the things that we can say example of when we uh, switch to this approach, uh, what will happen is you'll have an empty page, uh, all of a sudden you will you know, get you know, one, uh, whatever the first data point that comes out, you'll get that uh, component to be rendered, and progressively they'll, they'll come out you know, one by one uh, in some asynchronous fashion. And one of the great benefits of, you know, when you have a uh, distributed blocker like this is that even if two of the endpoints fail, uh, you're still going to actually get the other ones to render because they're not dependent on each other in any way. Uh, and uh, another example I find is really useful. Uh, instead of just having this information appear on the page, one of the things that's really useful is to give some context of what they can uh, expect, right? So imagine if you already have the layout uh, of this page in place that uh, they, if, if you have the layout in place, they, they know what they can expect, and you're just progressively enhancing the page and adding more data as it comes in, but the, but the larger structure of the page overall is gonna be pretty consistent. Uh, so uh, essentially how you kind of implement a skeleton like this um, is you're always gonna be passing that data to, to the component. Um, here I've added some extra step of, you know, checking whether uh, it, resetting it to be undefined. Uh, this, is probably unnecessary in most circumstances, but I'm just highlighting it here uh, for educational purposes because this will likely be an issue you may run into one point, but uh, null and undefined aren't the same thing. Uh, and if one of these things are null, uh, then you can be passing that into your user. So, I'm oh, sorry, into your uh, component. And uh, when we expand uh, this to look at what if each of those widgets might look like as far as the, the widget component, uh, when we are breaking down that structure, what we can do is uh, say, here are, are the properties that we are expecting uh, to receive to render this component properly. Uh, and if we don't get you know, all the things that we'd expect, uh, here are some default values, right? So one of the things that's really useful is now whenever we get one of these components, we'll say, uh, if we have no data from any endpoint yet, uh, we'll say, okay, we have uh, you know, the title or the followers or the icon. Uh, we'll have it all be defaulted uh, in some standard generic template or skeleton. Uh, and it, what it would look like is like this, this blank. Um, but as that information progressively comes in, what you can do is you can show you know, a few more pieces of data. You can also load those images. So you know, all the things will be defaulted in standard templated until uh, they become you know, fully accessible. Uh, and of course, you know, these things will progressively roll in, but it's just a lot more flexible of, when you at least show a template of what people expect versus you know, jumping straight from nothing to everything. Uh, so you know, we, we've looked at as far as unblocking other components on each other, what's another way that we can uh, optimize how we're rendering components? Uh, one of the things is around what's trying to look at the, the component life cycle and what areas seem to be slowest. 
I would say one of the areas that ha happens to have uh, the, the longest effect uh, here would be render. Uh, so essentially, whenever you're trying to repaint pixels on the screen, uh, that is very expensive uh, of a process. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the main perks of Reactive. They're saying, hey, let's have you know, virtual DOMs and do these comparisons uh, to not always repaint everything. So what, what is the way that we can try and minimize the amount of times that we call render? Uh, one, of, one of these, uh, we can do the short circuit, uh, apparent, uh, of checking whether we should actually update a component or not. So here, here what you're looking at is kind of a graph of uh, some component hierarchy, right? Uh, and all the uh, you know, red circles are ones that we need to redraw for some reason. Uh, and all the green ones are ones that we aren't going to be redrawing because of the way that the properties were updated. So uh, one of the key points I think very useful here though is uh, when we are checking, let's say for instance, C2, uh, we, when we override should component update and say, no, this component should not update, it's false, you know, proceed, uh, you're fine. Uh, then all of a sudden we don't need to try and recalculate or compare uh, the virtual DOM of all of its children. Uh, and we just assume it should remain the same and we don't re-render anything. Uh, so in, in general, that is a very useful way to, uh, even though the props may have updated, uh, to save you that comparison cycle uh, of all of your sub-child components. Uh, so as far as trying to track uh, where you should be introducing uh, should component update overrides into uh, your existing components, uh, one of the things that you should probably be looking at is repaints of thinking what parts of my application are getting rendered uh, too often. Uh, one of the things that you can actually use is a thing called that Chrome Render Tools, uh, which unfortunately here the, the projector, projector is a bit bad. But um, essentially what you're seeing here is all the areas that are highlighted green are areas that are currently being repainted uh, by Chrome. Uh, so essentially, you know, here you'll see certain actions of whenever you're checking something off your list or you're trying to add a new task item uh, the, the render seems to be pretty effective, but whenever you're actually appending an item to the list, you're doing an unnecessary amount of renders because you're actually you know, trying to re-render the entire list uh, instead of just adding one particular element. So when you get uh, some context of looking at uh, where these repaints are happening, uh, then you can hopefully uh, evaluate, hey, this is some extra unnecessary renders, let's try and use uh, should component update. Uh, so as far as uh, how, how to access this thing, if it's in every version of Chrome, uh, essentially, where, wherever you have your console, I uh, circled that little uh, expandable window, uh, but not only can you track where repaints are happening, uh, you can track uh, GPU usage uh, as well as uh, the frame rate of your page. Uh, so whenever there's a tip that you know, if we seems to be slowing down, that's just some extra context that you'll have. Uh, a separate point uh, that I find useful is around uh, method binding. So uh, a lot of people, whenever you're dealing with uh, callbacks, or event handlers, uh, they will all of a sudden say, hey, why are these things undefined? This doesn't seem to be working. Why don't I have access to all of my class methods? Uh, and particularly uh, a reason around that is, you know, when you are calling something like an on-click uh, in this circumstance, uh, you know, since you are not binding uh, the component uh, to the context of that execution, uh, your less likely to change. Uh, and in general, that will uh, make you lose context of, of those methods and, and lead to a lot of issues and uh, undefined usage. So some ways that you can kind of solve this, uh, the first, and say, hacky approach is trying to just add a bind directly in line. Uh, in general, that is probably uh, a little less than ideal just because every time that you are uh, re-rendering that component, you are going to you know, do that rebinding. Uh, so you know, every time you're rebinding, that's a little sublock and moves slightly slower. Uh, another kind of uh, option, uh, different option would be around uh, fat arrows. So whenever we use the arrow operator, uh, React or ES6 will implicitly call bind. So uh, here in this context, uh, you'd only ever call that bind once when you're defining uh, that method in that component. Uh, but in general, I'd say this is still a little sli slightly less than optimal because if you're working with a bit more junior developers, they may not have that context uh, of you know, knowing that that implicitly is happening. Uh, because whenever you're trying to implicitly change the scope of some argument, by just using something like an error operator that can confuse people a lot. Uh, and, and kind of a last example of how you try to do this is uh, something around uh, whenever you're using a constructor, uh, you can just directly bind there. So 
here, uh, not only are you, uh, you know, doing a very explicit uh, bind, but you only have to do it once. Uh, it's not every time it's rendering. So I think that's the, a pretty optional, uh, sorry, a pretty optimal balance as far as how to bind things. Um, looking into uh, actions and some ways that we can uh, improve those processes. Um, I noticed that a lot of people, when they are uh, developing React applications, trying to handle uh, event uh, actions and uh, reducer uh, callbacks, uh, they will use hard coded strings uh, all over the place, which in general, I would say it would lead you into a few different scenarios of either you had a typo and you are getting some undefined uh, query that you know, now you're saying, why isn't my reducer running, even though it should be, because uh, you had a typo. Uh, or unfortunately, uh, you will you know, leak something in production uh, and you'll have some conflict with, with the strings, which is problematic. So a way that I've found to kind of alleviate this uh, has been using a bit more class notation where you can uh, use a dot operator on uh, getting the exact strings you want. So here, I mean, as far as React is concerned, it's always the exact same uh, string. Uh, but now, as far as when you are trying to access these variables, uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, we have things like dot dot operators where uh, whether you are trying to compile your code or uh, run it, uh, or even in your IDE, uh, it will give you a lot more information saying, hey, this thing actually isn't defined, uh, and that'll give you a, a bit more of a heads up of whether you should actually be updating something or not, or trying to fix something. Um, of course, this is a bit of a, a simplistic example, more focused around funds. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do it, uh, but I think in general, having this more uh, you know, class syntax for defining these uh, action types versus just hard-coded strings uh, in general allows you to be a lot more uh, flexible and robust as far as preventing errors before they happen. Uh, another way that you can do, you know, these kind of layouts is uh, instead of having a, a direct dot, uh, sorry, a dot notation for every single uh, specific string, uh, you can have it uh, separated by objects or flows. Uh, so there, there's lots of different ways uh, that you can uh, separate out these types of uh, defining these strings, but in general, say class notation it does uh, save a lot of frustration. Um, another area that we can kind of improve how we call actions is around how we chain these things together. So there might be a lot of uh, environments where people are using like synchronous actions, where you know, you're progressively just calling one over the other, uh, and I'd say in general it's probably the, the worst case scenario because uh, if if all these uh, let's say if some of the inputs for action B are actually required uh, in or from part of the response for action A, well then, okay, there's probably nothing you can really do about that because you actually need that response object to then uh, process that, that sequential next action. Uh, but I'd say in general, uh, most times when you're firing these actions, uh, you don't have to uh, do them uh, sequentially, you can actually do them in parallel. So uh, whether you're doing some you know, fully uh, asynchronous uh, situation of you, know, you can pull everything at once, uh, or there might be some sub scenarios where you can only do uh, some partial asynchronous actions where uh, if you if one of your actions requires uh, an input that is the output of something else, uh, then of course you do have to wait. Uh, but at least, you know, instead of doing something sequentially, uh, you can use something like the all or any operator uh, and promises to uh, you know, wait until the, the shortest amount of time. So whether you know A or B finishes, then all of a sudden you can start C uh, and not a moment earlier. But in general, that's a, a, a nicer way to not have any wait time, but make each of these happen, uh, make each of these actions get called uh, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, a, a last point just around actions. Uh, it is useful whenever you have access to a uh, get state. So when uh, you have a store, essentially you can expose uh, any of your reducers uh, by calling get state. Uh, one of the, I'd say, useful ways, uh, it's kind of an app, uh, but to incorporate this in some of your actions is uh, if you have some follow-up or sequential uh, action that you need information from the store that wasn't inherently a, uh, a parameter uh, at the start, uh, you can grab a variable from that store. Uh, and it, for here, for instance, uh, what we're able to do is when we load the questions related to a task, uh, once those questions are loaded, uh, then we will verify, okay, uh, is this task currently done or is it pending? If it's done, uh, let's try and load the answers, right, using that ID that we just got. Uh, but if it's uh, still pending, then we'll just try and pre-populate uh, what the default answers are and not try and fetch those from the database because they don't exist yet. Uh, so this is a way that you, know, you can 
utilize uh, some access to the store uh, in your action lifecycle uh, to uh, a bit more simplistically uh, make uh, uh, sequential actions called. Um, as far as some general uh, things about how to handle a package or a project in React in general, uh, some of the things I've found pretty beneficial uh, that a lot of people don't necessarily use is one, environment files. So imagine the context where you are trying to call an API or define something, you know, uh, like Axios or something, where you have to set the, the URL host for the API that you're using. Uh, of course, in production and development environments, you're going to specify here is, you know, the production URL that I'm going to be using. Uh, but whenever you pull that code locally, uh, you're going to want to set uh, that API host to, you know, your local host endpoint. Uh, so, typically, if you are just using hard-coded strings and aren't using environment variables, uh, you'll either accidentally override something, uh, or you'll need to keep resetting that value before you commit any codes to GitHub. Uh, just because, you know, if you commit that file without reverting uh, that particular value, then all of a sudden you know, you're overriding it. Uh, so one of the things that I found useful is when you have a, a .end file, essentially you put it up in the base directory of your project, uh, that will be all the default values that will happen in you know, production, development, staging environments. Uh, and whenever a developer is working on your project, uh, they can specify overrides. So in end local, uh, essentially what they're able to do is uh, override any of those particular variables that have the same exact context. I'm sorry, same exact name, uh, and that file doesn't actually have to be checked into GitHub, so they don't have to worry about, you know, do I need to reset these variables? Uh, are they you know, going to conflict? Uh, this, in general, takes a lot of uh, easy and worrying off of them. Uh, essentially, how this works, I mean, you know, whenever uh, your app is being bundled or packaged uh, at compile time, uh, these variables will get pulled from end and uh, directly injected into, into your source code. A separate uh, useful point I've noticed is around uh, trying to use wrappers uh, for your routes. So imagine you have some application where you have a lot of public guest routes, uh, but you also have some private routes that require login uh, user functionality. So for here we said, you know, I need access to the profile uh, or the settings page. We want to check that you're logged in uh, before allowing you to do anything. Uh, so one of the ways that we can kind of choose this that I've noticed is pretty useful is if you have this wrapper, uh, what we're able to do is, uh, when it's maps, we'll say, check the Redux state, uh, and say, is this person currently active? Uh, if so, like if they do have a session, great, let's we'll just uh, show them you know, whatever route that they're trying to access. Uh, but if they don't have a session active, what we can try and do is look up in a more persistent storage system, uh, you know, do they have a uh, session active there? just because it is useful that if someone is uh, opening a particular URL in their browser uh, for the first time, they don't have all that Redux state initialized, uh, but they may have a session stored in some other persistent place. So here's a way for you to check that. You know, if that's valid, cool, we can take those default values and update your Redux store to be prepared to provide those you know, authenticated routes. Uh, and if they don't, you, know, you can tell them, hey, you need to log in and just redirect them. Um, but in general, I mean, this, this example is focused a bit more around login. I uh, started trying to, you know, verify logins. But whenever you're uh, trying to apply some general actions or modify the lifecycle of a, how a route is accessed, uh, trying to do some form of wrap around those uh, can be a useful uh, exposure. Um, so some other uh, useful things I've noticed around that are trying to develop a offline first application. Uh, in general, whenever you're trying to access a website, uh, you of course, you know, uh, try and make different HTTP queries for, you know, all the various bundles or images. Uh, and one of the things that you're able to do here uh, with a web worker is uh, hijack those types of requests that are coming in and uh, store them uh, for later. So imagine, you know, if the first time someone opens your app, they request, okay, you need, you know, all the JavaScript, all the CSS. Uh, then what happens is once that information is uh, kind of cached locally, uh, they can totally turn off like all their internet connections. Uh, and the next time they load your website, uh, that web worker uh, will be registered on their browser and it will provide those files to them. Uh, so now all of a sudden you don't need uh, to query you know, your server for those files. Uh, you can just automatically start rendering them the app in offline. Uh, a separate point as far as uh, 
you know, that's a bit more about keeping track of uh, your files. Uh, but a separate last point uh, around, of course I mentioned local storage as kind of a useful persistent storage. There are a lot of different options out there. Uh, one interesting uh, modern example I found is around IndexedDB. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, how many teams seem to be implementing this, but it is a lot more of a uh, flexible and uh, modern approach versus the, let's say, traditional local storage, it gives you a lot more flexibility in how you want to be indexing things. Uh, so it does require some uh, extra context and difficulty about setting up, but I would say it is uh, probably worth it in, in the long run. If you are interested in uh, using persistent storage in your application for any way, you know, at least investigate uh, IndexedDB. It, it is uh, a pretty useful utility tool, uh, and it is supported in you know, every, every modern browser. Um, and kind of a last item uh, before I'd like to wrap up, I would like to highlight a particular tool that I think is very useful and probably underappreciated. Uh, so feel free to try and uh, guess along or uh, figure out what you think this might be before I reveal. But in general, imagine if there's a tool that uh, could help your team always get on the same standard. So of course, uh, whenever you have a bunch of different developers on the same team, uh, they will uh, have their own kind of coding styles and conventions, uh, and it's useful to get them all on the same page and use the same uh, practical standards. Uh, separate from that, imagine if every time you were about to commit uh, some silly mistake uh, to your GitHub repository, uh, there was a, a simple hint of saying, hey, you know, this is a bit of a suboptimal approach. There's maybe a slightly faster way uh, that you could be doing this action. Uh, maybe take a look. Uh, or if any time one of your uh, developers on your team is uh, trying to improve their coding standards, uh, it is a personalized system for showing them how they can get better, uh, and specifically how they're currently coding, how can they change it in a way uh, that, that is more effective. Uh, and of course it's free. Uh, for you, the guest uh, is ESLint, uh, essentially a, a command line utility that anytime you're compiling uh, your, your code, uh, you can verify if there's any kind of errors or warnings or mismatches of what your team decided it is a useful practice. So here we have uh, a few different examples of here we have an error because we didn't use camel case for a variable uh, because apparently our team set a, a hard standard of we want all of our variables to uh, be in camel case. Uh, our, our second uh, entry is a bit of a warning uh, where it seems that we said uh, that there's a, bar a variable that we assigned but wasn't used at any point in our code. So that's probably an example of someone that was you know, debugging, they're writing lots of stuff, juggling their code, and then all of a sudden, you know, when they're hitting commit, uh, they you know, accidentally left one line you know, still there. Uh, and, and the last example here is actually uh, when you're trying to use you know, a for in loop, uh, it'll make a suggestion saying, hey, that's a bit suboptimal, it's you know, on the prototype, you probably don't want to do that. Here's some other suggestions uh, as far as options that you can use as far as an uh, how do you modify your code uh, in a productive way? Uh, and, and some of the useful things is all these uh, examples or warnings or errors that you get uh, all have links and pretty extensive documentation. So here uh, is linked, uh, what you're able to do is they define all the rules and criteria of, hey, here's exactly how you can adopt this standard. Uh, here are some examples of what you don't want to do, and here are some examples of stuff that you do want to do. Um, so there are plenty of different ways that you can use uh, ESLint. Um, in general, I think that you know, there's lots of different style guides out there. Uh, the Airbnb one seems to be the most popular, uh, but it is pretty easy to incorporate. Uh, it only just takes a few minutes, uh, and in general will uh, help improve the overall quality of code and consistency of how you uh, are using conventions in your database. Uh, so uh, in general, I just want to say uh, I hope that you found, you'll find some value in trying to apply uh, any of these patterns with your team. Uh, and uh, if you want to chat further, uh, my email, Twitter, feel free to reach out. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, happy to answer them now. Thank you.